All right, Psalm 75. It's not a very long psalm, but don't worry. I've got plenty of content that's never been a problem in the past, so just uh, get comfortable. We got these nice new chairs, so it's easy to get comfortable, right? Um, no, this is a great psalm. There's so there's, I love all the doctrine in the psalms. It's great uh, for, for something that's, we could say, just a songbook, just a collection of songs. Uh, it's magnificent how much you can learn from these psalms and, and, the, and the great doctrine in them. Now, this is another psalm we saw last week. Um, you know, I expressed how I believe there was a lot, of, a lot of prophecies in Psalm 74. I believe the same thing with Psalm 75. We see prophecies here. There's a prophecy of the judgment to come, and we're going to see that laid out here. I think that's kind of one of the big themes of this passage, but let's dig into this, and we'll go through verse by verse. And excuse me, I have some other references that we're going to check out in the New Testament as well that I think line up perfectly with this psalm. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, Unto thee, O God, do we give thanks. Unto thee do we give thanks, for that thy name is near, thy wondrous works declare. And many of the psalms are going to start off similar to this, of just praising the Lord, because it is a psalm, it is a song, it is giving praise to God in his goodness. And whether the content, the subject matter is is um, what we would consider positive or negative, we still always start off praising the Lord and recognizing the, uh, the, the greatness of our Lord and Savior. So uh, this, like I said, this is no different. Starting off giving thanks, very appropriate for a psalm. Uh, continuing on here, verse number two. Uh, when I shall receive the congregation, I will judge uprightly. And we're already starting to see the context being formed here of a time period, he says, when I shall receive the congregation, and, and who is a congregation? Or another word for congregation is a church, right? So who does a church consist of or a congregation consist of? The believers, right? Believers in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not teaching a universal church, but he's saying when, when I shall receive the congregation, I will judge uprightly. And there's a judgment day that's coming at the time when all believers are going to be uh, gathered up and received by Jesus Christ when he comes back in the clouds and we meet him together in the air, there is going to be a judgment that comes on that very day. On that same day, there's a judgment to come. And we are going to see, look at verse number three, the earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. I bear up the pillars of it, Selah. So, it's not much of a stretch to see the, the prophecy that exists in this passage, right? Because he's saying when he receives a congregation, I'm going to judge. And when I judge, guess what? The earth and all the inhabitants are dissolved. And we know that once the, the uh, believers are taken up, that then God begins to pour out his wrath. And what we don't see in the Psalms, like these are, these are prophetic statements, but it's not putting the timeline like, say, Revelation does. Right? This is prophesying future events, but not in such an extremely detailed manner. It doesn't have to be detailed. It's just enough to let you know in this short psalm, hey, God's going to judge. He's going to gather up his congregation, and then I'm going to judge, and guess what? Everything's going to be dissolved. And that is the end. That, that is ultimately goes all the way to the end of his judgment. So he's got a judgment that comes, the day of the Lord. We'll see that, and in fact... If you would, please turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, and we'll see some supporting scripture uh, that I believe is talking about the same event. And I, I subtitled the sermon tonight, God is the Judge. And that comes from this passage, but we see in multiple places in Psalm 75 the reference to God's judgment, to God judging, and to God being the judge. As in verse number 2, he says, I will judge uprightly. And God is a perfect judge. God is a just judge. And judgment ultimately uh, belongs to the Lord. Now, many people today will say, well, see, God's a judge, so you can't judge and you can't say anything. Well, that's not true. The Bible does teach us, and I'm not going to go through all the, all the proof texts in Scripture tonight, but the Bible does teach us, you know, Jesus said judge not on the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Uh, you know, we're instructed to be able to judge between the wicked and the good. And honestly, if you're honest with yourself, everybody judges all the time 
Anyways, you have to make judgments. How, how else do you determine if something is good or bad, if something is wicked or if it's righteous? You could only do that through making judgments. So we need to make judgments, but we do so, or we ought to do so. All of our judgments ought to be derived from the word of God, from the ultimate lawgiver and judge of truth and righteousness. So we receive that judgment from God, and then we can share and, and show other people, hey, this is the right, righteous judgment. This is the judgment of God. And then we can start to judge within ourselves whether things are good or evil because it's based on what the judge said. Just like people who say, you know, uh, you know who think they can't know for sure if they're going to be saved, right? And the reason why they think that is because they're thinking that's based on how good of a person they are. They say, well, God's going to weigh everything and God's the judge, right? So you can't know if you're going to heaven. I can't know if I'm going because... You know, God's going to ultimately judge everything that I did. That's what a lot of people think, but it's a false understanding of what's going to happen. And, and those people, of course, need to get saved because the Bible very clearly tells us that, yes, God is the judge. We'll see that very clearly here. God is the judge. But the Bible tells us how God will judge. We don't have to wonder at it. We don't have to question, well, I don't know. How is God going to judge? Because if he's already told us how he's going to judge, then we don't have to question anymore because God's not a liar. God's not a deceiver. God's not going to change his mind and, and say, well, you know, I know I said that before, but really I'm just going to do something different now. That's not a holy God. That's not who God is, right? So um, we know how God is going to judge because he told us. We know that there's none righteous, no, not one, and the, the wages of sin is death. We know that God's judgment upon all sin is ultimately the lake of fire. That's the judgment. It's an eternity in hell. And God's a righteous judge, and that's what it is. And if we're all, we're all guilty of that judgment, but the only reason we get to escape is because that, that penalty was paid by Jesus Christ. So we're able to receive forgiveness of sins through the blood of Jesus Christ, which he shed when he died on the cross and rose again from the dead for us. So um, anyways, that's uh, obviously the gospel. It's what we believe, and that's how we know. But God is the judge nonetheless, and um, let's continue. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 1. The Bible reads, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Now, I, I wanted to get this whole passage in context because it is all relevant. And he's starting off just by saying that he wanted the people that he's addressing here to be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. Well, the psalmist in Psalm 75 is one of those holy prophets here that they ought to be reminded of because Psalm 75, I believe we're going to see this, is talking about what he is about to talk to, uh, speak to here. So not just the, the words of the prophets, but also the commandment of the apostles and you know, the, 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 the more modern day prophets of the Lord at that time. To, to combine all of that, he says this in verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And he's explaining the mindset that people will have saying, you know, going back of old, there's all these prophecies saying, you know, where is the Lord? When is he coming back? Everything just keeps on going the way it has been. And it's, and it's going to be this mindset of people who are thinking, that, look, it's not true. It's not going to happen. And one of the things that doesn't help people with this mindset are all the date setters on the prophecies, all the false prophets that want to tell you, oh, no, Jesus is coming back. He's coming back on this date. He's coming back in this year and this date, you know, and then he doesn't come back. And people hear that over and over and over again, right? And especially unbelievers, they hear that and it's like, Unbelievers don't know who's, you know, everyone's trying to claim things and it seems like no one knows what they're talking about. So it's easier to then just dismiss it and be like, look, you guys have been saying, and they'll say you guys in, in a broad context, right? You guys have been saying this stuff for a long, it's no, nothing's happening, nothing's changed. It's all just continues the same way it is. You know, I'm not scared. I don't have to worry about Jesus Christ coming back because 
that's all just a bunch of nonsense. This is going to be the attitude of the people when Christ actually does come back. And he's, and he's letting us know this in 2 Peter chapter 3. He says uh, that there's, you know, there's scoffers. And verse 5 says, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. So the people are willingly ignorant because they don't want to know. It's not that there aren't people explaining, hey, there was a flood, the creation, you know, God's already destroyed this earth once. It's going to happen again. And this is part of the prophecy, just saying just as things were uh, men were violent and things were wicked in days of Noah, it's also going to happen again. And people are just willingly ignorant of that. There's evidence of a worldwide flood. There's evidence of the destruction that God has rained down on this earth in the past. There's evidence of Sodom and Gomorrah being burnt up. There's evidence of, of a, you know, like I said, a global flood and, and all these various evidences, but people want to be willingly ignorant and just not see that that is true. Verse 7 says, But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against what? The day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So this is now bringing up a day of judgment. This day of judgment, instead of being a judgment of water, it's going to be a judgment of fire. But the context in Psalm 75, he's saying, I'm going to judge uprightly the earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. Remember, that was where we're segueing into this passage. So let's keep reading here. Verse number 8 in 2 Peter chapter 3. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And he's addressing the comments of the people at the time we're going to have saying, oh, where is this coming? He's not coming. Everything's still the same. He's like, what? <laughs> Hey, don't forget who God is in that it doesn't matter if it's a thousand years or not. Because for God, it's like a day. It doesn't even matter. It could be a day. It could be a thousand years. Doesn't matter to the Lord. Us, yeah, of course it matters. We have smaller lifespans, you know, God. But God's outside of time. God's in eternity. Doesn't matter to him at all. It's not like he's not going to do it, even though it is for us now 2,000 years since Christ was on this earth. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Because for God, it's like two days. The Lord is not slack, verse 9, concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And this is that fervent heat judgment at the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, we, we went over this in the past. The day of the Lord happens right after the same day as the day of Christ. The day that Christ comes back and receives the congregation is the same day that God will start pouring out his wrath. And that wrath will be poured out. And some of those judgments are going to be, you know, fire mingled with blood coming down on the earth and scorching the earth and destroying, you know, a third of the trees and, and, and all the other uh, um, apocalyptic events that happen in the book of Revelation. So uh, it says the elements will, shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works therein shall be burned up. Look at verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. Isn't that the same phrase that we saw in Psalm 75, 3, the earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So, Again, there's a reference to the day of the Lord that brings in, that begins all of the destruction that's going to come. And then in the end, of course, we know there's, a, there's still a thousand year reign of Christ. And then there's the, the ultimate destruction of the earth and, and the, the heavens and the earth are going to pass away. And then we have a new heaven and new earth going into eternity. 
And, but the fact that things are being burnt up with, with fervent heat, and just because it says that things are going to be dissolved, that doesn't necess- that's not implying that that's the total destruction of the earth. It's still destruction that's coming down on the earth. It's not, it's not the annihilation and the wiping out at the uh, great white throne judgment. It's, it's just describing the destruction that's going to come down upon this earth. So don't, don't, don't let this try to mess with your head. If you've, been, if you've looked at this in the past going like, well, it sounds like all this stuff. It's just the judgment that comes down because the elements are going to burn. I mean, elements meaning not like the periodic table of elements, the elements of like what's on the earth, right? It's not talking about everything being wiped away, but uh, just the amount of destruction that's going to come on this earth. And this is also then saying, well, hey, look, if you know that all this stuff's going to happen, then what are you living for, right? All this stuff here is going to be destroyed and burnt up, and, and God's going to rain wrath on this earth. So why do you care about all the things of this earth? Because it's all just going to be dissolved anyways. It's all going to go away. So don't let that be your focus in this life. Because we ought to be, like it says in verse 13, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Let's go back to Psalm 75. Verse number four. Bible reads, I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly, and to the wicked, lift not up the horn. And this fits in, again, a much shorter passage, but it sounds like it's pretty still kind of staying in line with Second Peter chapter 3 with that last verse that I just read about, hey, since we know that these things are going to happen, you know, what, what mindset ought you to have? And we should be looking for the new heavens and new earth. Just as in Psalm 75, he says, hey, the earth and all the inhabitants are dissolved. I bear up the pillars of it, Selah, and then start saying, hey, I said unto the fool, deal not foolishly, right? Like, like, what ought, manner of life ought you to be living now? Judgment's coming. God's going to bring judgment on this earth. So, hey, fools, maybe you should stop being foolish, right? Stop dealing foolishly. And to the wicked, lift not up the horn. Lift not up your horn on high. Speak not with a stiff neck. It's an admonition to wicked people what does that mean, lift up the horn? It's, it's, it's lifting up your horn. It's, it's themselves and putting themselves above other people. Typically in the scripture, when we see references to horns as people that are rulers or people in power. And he's saying to the wicked, look, don't lift yourself up. Don't have this proud, haughty attitude with a stiff neck that, that can't hear rebuke that isn't going to hear what anyone else has to say. They're full of pride. They're full of arrogancy. They're people that can't be taught. He's trying to give them some wisdom here. Look, God's going to judge. You might not want to go down that path. You might, you might want to, to reconsider. You might want to uh, consider that God's judgment is coming. And are you ready? Now, there's false preaching that's going to say, hey, are you ready for God's judgment? Meaning you got to clean up your life and start doing all these good things. But when I'm talking about, you know, when you talk to the wicked person, look, are you ready for God? Because God is going to come and judge. Do you want to have to pay for all your sins or do you want them all paid for? Because God is going to judge. And God's a righteous judge. And look, we're all guilty of sin. You want to just keep on living wickedly and, and piling on your sin? Or are you going to be ready when that judgment happens? Because most wicked people, they don't, they, they don't even think God is real or they're not, going to, they're not considering the fact that God is a God of judgment. If all anyone ever hears, oh, God's just love, there's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing to be, to be fearful about. You ought to be fearful because God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And the, the admonition, the warning here is, hey, don't lift up your horn on high. Don't speak with a stiff neck that no one can tell you anything. You know, take some, get some wisdom here and be able to receive rebuke. Verse 6 says, for promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. And, of course, what does that leave? The north. And what is north? Up. Uh, because even historically, and I think this is just kind of an interesting fact anyways, that, that even going back in history, people have always looked to north as being up, right? If you look on a map, 
it's oriented around north always pointing up. And it's kind of, it almost just seems arbitrary. Like, well, why not south or why not east or why not west or why wouldn't other people do it differently? Well, they didn't. And, and north is tied also because they use a lot of the stars for navigation and stuff. Because you follow the north star, that was always, it's always true to, to, to get your bearings on direction. And, of course, the north star is straight up also, at least for us in this hemisphere, right? So that's what we have to, to follow. But promotion so what does that mean? Being lifted up, being exalted. It comes from God. So the admonition is don't exalt yourself. Don't try to lift yourself up. Don't be full of pride and, and trying to advance yourself. You need to stay humble. And turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 14. You need to stay humble and let God exalt you. Let God promote you. Let God be the one who will um, elevate your status and, and promote you. So uh, and, you know, this, this concept should go and permeate through all of your life. So in your Christian life, you want to earn rewards, you want to you be able to, to be pleasing in God's eyes, humble yourself and serve others. And don't try to insert yourself into everything and be, you know, like, be at the front of everything, be the servant be behind the scenes, be helping in any way possible to help and minister and serve. That's how you end up being promoted, right? So people who have a desire, you know, for example, to be a bishop one day and you desire the office of a bishop and you want to be, you know, pastoring a church and preaching sermons and kind of out in front of everybody. Well, you know what? In order to get that honor of being able to do that job, you need to humble yourself and you need to serve. And you need to be a person who's willing to do whatever job is necessary and be faithful and stay and be reliable, dependable, and able to do any job. Whatever needs to be done, you're there to do it. You're not lifting up yourself. You're waiting for that opportunity then for someone else to give you that promotion. Ultimately for God to give you that promotion. But not just in like spiritual life or even, you know, in regards to being a pastor, but just your day-to-day -day life. How about at work? You know, you're seeking a promotion on the job. You don't need to exalt yourself. And I, and I recommend don't exalt yourself to your boss. You're going to come off sounding proud and arrogant. And people who are like that, a lot of managers and bosses are not going to want to then give you a promotion or exalt you in your status at, within a company because you sound like a braggart. You sound like a blowhard. You sound like an arrogant jerk, and they're not going to want to give that to you. Be humble. Work hard. Prove yourself just by working, not by trying to do self-exaltation to anybody. Let the honor be bestowed upon you. Jesus taught this here because the Pharisees were full of pride. The Pharisees were full of themselves. They were full of hypocrisy, but they were full of themselves too. And they, they thought that they were so great and they looked down upon the common folk and they looked down even probably upon each other. And we see here the attitude and Jesus observed what they were doing when he went to this feast. Look at verse number seven in Luke 14. The Bible says, and he put forth a parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms. So Jesus is at this feast and he's just observing and he's just watching and he's seeing these Pharisees come in and he's seeing them just come and take the best place and just take the best seat and take the best spot. And, and like they just come in and it's like, ha, yeah, I got the best spot right now. And that's their attitude. Now look, it's easy to talk about the Pharisees that way and everyone's just like, yeah, hey, man, yeah, those stupid Pharisees. Are you doing that in your life? I need the best. Oh, I'm here first. I'm going to get the first spot. I'm going to get the best spot. That's not how we ought to be thinking. It's a childish way to think, right? But, you know, children need to learn humility, and it starts at home. So when the kids are, oh, I'm first, and I want to be first, and I get the best spot. No, 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 no. We ought to be teaching our children to be humble and to allow for those best spots to go to someone else. And you be willing to take the worst spot 
you get in somewhere first and whatever the best seat is, hey, let someone else get there first. Let someone else have that spot. Say, hey, look, we've got this spot for you. This is what is a Christ-like way of behaving and having your mindset be not something that's just real self-centered. Because, yeah, in the moment you might get that, that one seat or something, but you know what's going to happen is that you're going to be brought low. You're going to be humiliated. You're going to be abased at some point. And Jesus explains this here. Look at verse number eight. When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, give this man place. And thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. So you're saying, yeah, you just show up. You're like, oh, this must be for me. And it's like the most fancy seat and the, the, the best area and the best spot. And then, and then they show up and be like, uh, no, no, I actually have this reserved from someone else. You're going to have to go. You know, that's embarrassing. That brings shame. You're going to be like, oh, you look like a fool because here you are thinking you're so great and you deserve all this. And now it's just being brought up in front of everybody like, yeah, you got to go somewhere else, buddy, because that's not for you. He says, but when thou art bidden, verse 10, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, friend, go up higher. Let someone else give you the praise or give you the honor and just say, you know, I'm just going to take the word. I'm, I'm, I'm good back here. I'm good. I'm good here. No, 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 no. Hey, no, no. Look, you're, you're a poor guy. You come here. Fine. Someone else is, is bestowing that honor on you. You're not just taking it for yourself. It says, then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. God wants to see a humble attitude. I mean, think about it. Who humbled themselves any more than Jesus Christ? The King of kings and Lord of lords, the Prince of Peace, came down to this earth as a little baby, as a, as a human child. You know, God humbled himself and was manifest in the flesh and, and suffered death, even the death of the cross. He suffered that shame. He suffered, you know, his own creation spitting on him and rejecting him and reviling him and beating him up. That's a lot of humility. But that's why there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's why at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. Because he has a name that is above every name. Why? Because he humbled himself and, and showed the example of humility to be so selfless and self-sacrificial for the benefit of others. That's the Christian mindset. So, you know, like I said, we can look at certain examples and we can look at the Pharisees and we can look at this rebuke and be like, I don't have a stiff neck and I'm, you know, well, do you though, right? In some areas, maybe you're great, but think about that. This ought to permeate all areas of your life to where you're not just thinking so highly of yourself and just you deserve this and you deserve that. And you, you know, you ought to be thinking, I don't deserve anything. And when you're humble, people will give you things. Look, I, I can testify to this just in, in really small examples, and I'm not going to go into them because it doesn't really matter, but just little small examples when you actually have this in your life and you play this out and just, and just say, you know what, I'm going to start doing things this way, it will, you will receive then, in the end, you'll end up receiving some honor where people are saying, no, 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 you, you know, you come over here. It happens. Because God likes the humble, and he'll, he'll lift up then the person who's being humble. And it's, it's great because it works out in two ways, because you always have people who are full of pride and think that they're so great, so God's able to usually simultaneously exalt one and bring down another 
just you know at the same time. Like like in this in this parable in this story, you've got the guy who, assumingly, is the humble guy that 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 is the guest of honor, who's being praised and exalted and lifted up, and then the guy who thought of himself really highly is is simultaneously being abased and brought low. So. Um, Let's go back to Psalm 75. Promotion comes from above. It comes from the north. And why does the world even work this way? Why does life work this way? Because God is the judge. Because God is real. Because there is a God in heaven that's able to make these things happen. Verse 7 in Psalm 75 says, But God is the judge. He putteth down one, and he setteth up another. God is able to abase. He's able to exalt. This, this goes all throughout Scripture. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. God, being the judge, he's in charge. And he will determine who gets put down and who gets set up. And, you know, this happens through all nations. Not just his own people, not just his own kingdom. But he's able to, to lift up one no matter where they are or who they are and, and be able to, to establish or to bring low. And we see a little example of this in Romans chapter 9. Look at verse number 17. The Bible reads, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Now, who raised up Pharaoh? God did. Now, Pharaoh was high-minded of himself, and he didn't give uh, any care at all about who the Lord was because it's apparent when you go back and read the stories who is the Lord right when Moses is trying to say look we need to go worship the Lord we need to offer sacrifices and and you know we have to follow what God said and he's just like who is the Lord he didn't care at all he cares about himself but it doesn't matter God is the one that put him in that position but see God's also the one that then brought him low it was through the mighty arm of God that that all the the plagues happened in Egypt and that Pharaoh was brought low. Uh, he says, even for this purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Verse 18, therefore at the mercy on whom you have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles? Now, a lot of, I'm not going to get into the Calvinistic teaching on this because there is no Calvinism here in the Bible or anywhere in the Bible. It just doesn't exist. But the reason why I like turning Romans 9 to get this established is because I think kind of what we're seeing in the scripture here is the, the, the praise that God deserves and the understanding of God being the judge of God is in charge and God is, is uh, the ultimate authority. And we need to recognize that. And you know what? Sometimes people are going to be lifted up and sometimes they're going to be brought down. So we just need to stay humble because we don't know what God's going to do. He may exalt you and, and lift you up or he might just let you stay humble and, and in want of some things, right? And not have all of the riches or whatever in this world. Or he might lift you up in front of you. He might, you know, your name might be cast down as mud or it might be lifted up. But let's just let God do his thing, and we know that he's good in whatever he chooses to do. And in the end, God's name is going to be exalted, and we just stay humble because even if it doesn't happen in this lifetime, 
that exaltation will happen to those who are low, who those are the lowly and the humble in Christ. God will exalt. And it's even better to be exalted in the kingdom to come than it is in this kingdom. It's way better. I don't want my riches here. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to, to be like, oh, okay, here's your reward and get it here. I want to get my reward later because that lasts forever. So anything you get here, I mean, yeah, it's, it's nice when if, if you can have your name exalted or something like that here, but that's not going to last. So we don't strive to even make sure that we're exalted in, in the eyes of this world because this world's going to be gone. We just want to make sure that God is pleased with us and that we can remain humble and lowly for him to lift us up. And when you have people trying to, because at the end of the day, how can you fight against God anyways? If God wants to, to exalt one and bring down another, then that's what's going to happen. You know, these men get so full of themselves and so proud and so arrogant, they think they could actually do something against the Lord. And they can't. I mean, like, the, like Nebuchadnezzar is like, look at all this that I have done. And then he's made like an animal for seven years Amen. out eating grass and, until like literally his hair is becoming like bird feathers and his, his fingernails are growing out like claws, like he's starting to look like an animal. You're like, you didn't do any of this. God lifted you up for his purposes to bring judgment on the people he needed to bring judgment on. It's not because of you, Nebuchadnezzar. And then he realized that too and, and humbled himself and, and exalted the name of the Lord, right? But then you also have, uh, uh, who was it in, in the New Testament? Um, was it Herod that you know, people said, oh, it's the voice of a God, yep. right? Was it Herod? And, and, and then, like, he doesn't give God the praise, and guess what? He falls over dead. God brought him low. Like, he thinks he's all that. He's not correcting the people, right? Because that's a little bit too much exaltation. That's a little bit too much praise. You're not worthy of that. I don't care, I don't care if it's coming from someone else, someone else trying to say, you're God. You go, no, I am not. <laughs> right? that, that's going way too far. It's way overboard. Uh, no, I'm not God. Give God the praise, not his creation. So let's go uh, back to Psalm 75. We, we're going to see more reference here, though. Um, I'm going to reread a little bit of the passage to get it back in context because we've been jumping around a lot. We're in verse number 8, but just to, to kind of bring back the context... The Bible says, unto thee, O God, do we give thanks, starting in verse 1. Unto thee do we give thanks, for that thy name is near, thy wondrous works declare. When I shall receive the congregation, I will judge uprightly. The earth and all the inhabitants are ever dissolved. I bear up the pillars of it, Selah. I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly, and to the wicked, lift not up the horn. Lift not up your horn on high, speak not with a stiff neck. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and sitteth, setteth up another. All being mindful of the events to come, right? In, in this context of Psalm 75, he's saying, look, don't, you know, don't be foolish. Don't lift yourself up. God's going to lift up and God's going to bring down. He's the judge. Verse 8 says, for in the hand of the Lord, there is a cup and the wine is red. It is full of mixture, and he poureth out of the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. Now, more clearly or more vividly in Revelation, but again, there's no accident here that this, these words are even being used in Psalm 75 because there's only so like there's only a couple references to an event like this happening and they go hand in hand with the context in both areas right so here we're already seeing the context of destruction to come of God being the judge of judgment coming down right and then this cup of wine being brought up and being poured out and then even with the dregs 
We'll get into that in just a second. But the drag, what's the dregs? The dregs is just the, the pulpy part. It's the solid part. So like if you, if you squeeze the grapes, right, and you make that grape juice because that's what, which another word for that in the Bible is wine. You squeeze that out, you're going to have some debris. And especially when it, when it settles a little bit, a lot of that will settle. And that's kind of more like the refuse than it is the juice, right? A lot of times you'll strain out the dregs and, and make it more pure. Um, but what it's saying here is that all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. So the, the wicked are looking for the, the, the refuse, the, the, the worst part of the wine, right? Like, give me, give me that part of it, the dregs. But... Let's see what, what reference we have here in Revelation 14. Verse number 9, the Bible says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So here we see this, this wine of God's wrath, of his indignation being poured out and people being tormented in hell, essentially everyone who takes the mark of the beast. That's one reference here to this cup, this wine that's being poured out. Turn if you would to Isaiah chapter 51. We'll see another reference here. Isaiah 51. They said there's only a few references of wine being poured out, like in God's hand, and none of them are good. These aren't positive references. This isn't like the, the drink offering or something, right? This is, this is wrath. This is anger. This is God's indignation being poured out on these people because of the judgment that is to come. Isaiah 51, look at verse number 17. The Bible says, Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. Now, this is even more closely related to what we saw in Psalm 75. Because that's referencing the dregs, it's re referencing wringing them out and, you know, drinking of that. Verse 18, there is none to guide her among all the sons whom she hath brought forth. Neither is there any that taketh her by the hand of all the sons that she hath brought up. These two things are come unto thee. Who shall be sorry for thee? Desolation and destruction and the famine and the sword. By whom shall I comfort thee? Thy sons have fainted. They lie at the head of all the streets as a wild bull in a net. They are full of the fury of the Lord, the rebuke of thy God. Therefore, hear now this, thou afflicted and drunken, but not with wine. Thus saith thy Lord, the God and thy God that pleadeth the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt no more drink it again, but I will put it into the hand of them that afflict thee, which have said to thy soul, bow down that we may go over. And thou hast laid thy body as the ground and as the street to them that went over. So he's describing this destruction, but it's the destruction to Jerusalem. He's saying, look, I poured out my anger upon you and my fury upon you, and you drank of that cup, and you drank of the dregs, and, you know, and, and he's saying, you were brought low, and you were brought down. He's saying, but now I'm going to bring it to those who have afflicted you because they, they needed to be punished. God's people needed to be punished. They needed to be uh, humbled. They needed to be brought low. And not, I mean, it wasn't a good way because this, this, this wine of God's indignation was poured out and, and they received of that. He's saying, now I'm going to use that same cup and I'm going to pour it out unto those who, uh, who afflicted you, where he says, like, you, you've laid your body as the ground and as the street to them that went over, people walking all over his people. So it's another foreshadowing of God's uh, wrath and the wine of God's wrath to be poured out again. So 
again, Psalm 75, going back to Psalm 75, we see the only, kind of the only other times we see these things being referenced. It's, of course, talking about this serious destruction. This is um, always great advice anyways, but very prophetic at the same time. So all these things we could learn, even if we're not living in the end, you know, like if we don't make it to the time of the rapture or through these events that are prophesied, even if you never get to there, this still describes how we ought to be living our life anyways. We know that God's a judge. So we ought to live our life appropriately knowing that God is a judge. We ought to warn others, warn the fools, warn the people that want to lift themselves up and be self-exalting. Look, God, God's the one that's going to set up or bring down. Don't try to do that. Don't try to play God. Don't try to take that power into your own hands. You're going to end up looking like a fool. You're going to end up being abased. You're going to be brought down, and God's not going to be happy about you trying to do things your own way. Submit yourself unto the Lord. Look at verse number 9. But I will declare forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked also will I cut off but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. This is when God, the judge, brings in his judgment. He sets everything right. At the judgment day, look, everyone's going to face a judgment day. Everyone is going to face a judgment. Now, those that are in the book of life aren't going to be judged by their works and cast in the lake of fire like those who are not in the book of life. Great white throne judgment when God's casting people into the lake of fire that's for the dead. That's for those whose names are not written in the book of life, like Revelation chapter 20 says, verses 14 and 15. We often use that out soul winning, right? When, when, uh, and, and earlier in that passage, when the dead deliver up, the, you know, the seed delivers up the dead that was in it, and death and hell deliver up the dead that were in them, and they stand before the judgment seat, and they are judged according to their works. Because the books are opened up, and, and God, the judge, finds them guilty before the Lord, and they are cast into that lake of fire where they will be eternally tortured and punished for all of eternity, for all time. And that is the righteous judgment of God. As believers, we don't ever have to face that ju judgment. Christ paid that penalty for us. Praise the Lord. But we have our own judgment seat. We have the judgment seat of Christ. And that's based on what we do in this lifetime. And we need to remember that God is judge. We need to remember that, that we're going to be standing before the judgment seat of Christ, where he's also going to judge us according to our works. The good thing is, is that our sins, that just like anything that we did that was not good for anything just gets burned up. We don't get burned up. Those works are just gone, right? Because we're forgiven of all of our sins. So it's not, it's not a time of, of berating for your sins, but it is going to show forward, hey, were you spiritually minded in this life? Were you working towards that new heaven and new earth, the new Jerusalem? Is that how you invested your time here on this earth? Because that will show forth, and that's where you're going to get the rewards from when you humbly serve the Lord and do the things that, that God wants you to do, walking by faith, not by sight, knowing that there is a kingdom to come, knowing that there's a new Jerusalem, this is how then you'll be judged. Oh, look, you did, uh, you did walk that, that way. You did walk that path. You did do the things that, that I said to do. You had to be humble. I mean, every time you go out and preach the gospel, you got to be humble. We're going out humbly and trying to instruct those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will grant them repentance unto life, right, that, that they can receive the gospel, we need to go out and humbly teach people and show them the right way. And you need to sacrifice your time and do the right thing and, and try to build your own testimony and, and live a, 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 a righteous, sold-out, holy life for the Lord to be more impactful and to win over more people to Christ at the end of the day. But in order to do that, you need to stay humble. So God is the judge. We know that. But we also, God's told us, he's told us how he's going to judge. He's told us, about, that's why I'm talking about the judgment seat of Christ, because it's in the Bible. And he told us that 
the, the wood, hay, and stubble is going to be burned up. And he told us that the, the gold, silver, and precious stones are going to abide. He told us that. And he told us that there's going to be people cast into the lake of fire. He told us all this. This is a judgment. Oh, you're sending people to hell. I'm not sending anyone to hell. Oh, you're reprobating people. I'm not reprobating anybody. You reprobate yourself. But God told us at least you know, a lot of characteristics, and he showed us how we can be aware of reprobates. It's God's judgment. I'm not the one bringing the judgment. I could just see it, and I'm going to judge according to the word of God. You're like, wow, yeah, that's, look, look, this example lines up perfectly with what the word of God says. And God determined certain people to be reprobate. And God determined that some people are going to be cast into the lake of fire. And who are those people going to be? Those that don't have Christ. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Hey, I don't have to condemn you. You're condemned already. I'm not sitting on the throne and judging people, but you know what? God is, and he told us how he's judging. Jesus Christ himself said, He that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's why you haven't believed. You're judged already. You're condemned already. You're guilty. Praise the Lord for his judgment, and we thank him for giving us the wisdom and the instruction so we can know his judgment. We're not, we shouldn't be ignorant. We're fully aware. We, have, we, we know the laws. We know the judgment. It's not a mystery. And we need to bring forward this truth and this wisdom to a, a lost world, a deceived world, an ignorant world that don't know these things. So that we could lead them to Christ. Let's bow our heads. I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for, for being such a righteous judge. And we know that no matter how many injustices that we face in this lifetime, that you are a righteous judge and all the wrongs will be made right. And you see the right, you see the wrong. And, and Lord, that nothing is going to get by you. We thank you for your long suffering and mercy, dear Lord, that we are uh, even given the time to be able to change our minds, to be able to put our trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior. We thank you for that, that opportunity and that option to be able to get saved because someone loved us enough to die for us, dear Lord, and um, to take our penalties of the sins that, that we've committed, that, that we deserve to pay for, but uh, that we were loved enough to have those paid for us. We thank you for that. And I pray that you please help us to share that good news and share that good message with others. That, uh, that do oppose themselves and that might be caught in the, in the snares of the devil. Lord, I pray that you would please just help us to, to lead those people to Christ and, and Lord, help us to overcome our own sins in this world that we can um, just serve you faithfully, God. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.